Well, thank you, Emma, for reading for us. And uh, good morning. My name is Mike. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, I hope you've been enjoying our Building Hope series. I I think there's so much uh, to be excited with what God is doing in our church. If you think of of the things we've been thinking about uh, the last two weeks already. And uh, if you're here for the first time today, what we do each year is we set aside uh, three weeks uh, each year to think about what God is doing in us uh, as his church. So what we're doing today is a little bit different. If you're here for the first time, uh, just understand that. Uh, We're actually going to have two talks today. Sorry, I'm being uh, greedy for time. Uh, The first talk really will focus on the passage that was just read out. Uh, And then the second talk will speak uh, specifically about what God is doing here in our church. Uh, And in a sense, think together on some things that we need to talk about as a church. So again, if you're here for the first time... It's so good you're here, but just I just want to be up front, today is a little bit different uh, to normal Sundays, just so you know. And just, just to remind us of where we've been so far, uh, during the first week of our Building Hope series, we looked at Jesus' words in Matthew 28. So it's up on the screen, Jesus says this, uh, he, this set the whole of our Building Hope series this year. Jesus says, all authority has been given to me. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And in Matthew 28, uh, that's up on the screen, we, we saw God's vision. That was week one. We saw what God's vision is. God wants more people to become followers of Jesus, his son. And then he wants those people who become followers of Jesus, his son, to become more and more like Jesus, his son, to the praise of God's glory. That's what we saw. It's ultimately about God, not about us, and he's worthy of the praise. And then last week, we saw God's vision in action because we saw 14 brothers and sisters baptized in that name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, just like Matthew 28 says. And here's a photo in case you missed it. That was last week. Uh, A great day celebrating these 14 brothers and sisters. Uh, A picture that really shows that those 14 who've decided to follow Jesus, they're no longer a part of that kingdom of darkness. No longer a part of that domain of darkness, but are now part of God's kingdom. Followers of God's son. They've decided to follow Jesus. That's the massive thing we celebrated last week, which is huge. And last week we looked at Matthew 16 when Jesus says this, it's up on the screen. He said, Jesus says, if anyone wants to come with me, he must deny himself Take up his cross and follow me. For because whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me, Jesus, will find it. And again, that's what we witnessed last week. We witnessed 14 brothers and sisters who have decided to follow Jesus, to deny themselves and take up their cross and live for Jesus. And this week, our third and final week is Commitment Sunday. This is a week where we need to stop and consider, well, are we committed to this vision? Are we committed to what God is doing here in our church as part of God's family? And like I said in week one, today I'll be up front and I'll be honest with you. No spin, no no sales marketing speech, no man in a suit on a rocket, if you remember again the first week. But what I want to have is an honest conversation with us as a church in light of what Jesus says to us. And you uh, should have noticed as you came in that you were given uh, two handouts today. You'll need two. Uh, I'll give you an opportunity, if you haven't got the second one, to put your hand up a little bit later on to to grab that. Uh, Because, again, we're doing something different. One of the handouts is uh, the normal handout, and the second handout is a bit of a special handout. And uh, here's an exercise in self-control. Like every time I tell my kids at home when the hot chips have just come out of the oven, I say, don't touch. What do they do? They touch, and then they cry, and then they whinge. Leave that uh, second hand out alone for the moment. We'll think about that in the second half of the talk. So leave that alone, exercise in self-control. Because I want to start by looking at Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 6 that Emma just read for us. In Matthew chapter 6, it will force us to ask a question, what are we committed to? It will force us to ask the question, what do we seek first? And as always, Jesus' words, they'll be very searching. They'll challenge us to have an honest conversation in light of what he says and ask ourselves, actually, what is it that I seek first? Uh, What is it that I seek above all else? What is most fundamental in my life? 
So let's jump straight in, and this is point one now on your normal uh, handouts. What do we seek first? A question about masters. So have a look at what Jesus says in verse 24. This is just before what Emma read for us. Have a look at what Jesus says. Chapter 6, make sure you've got your Bible open from verse 24. Jesus says, No one can be a slave of two masters, since either he will hate one and love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot be slaves of God and of money. And so what you seek first is a question about masters. Who is your master? Or what is your master, for that matter? Or another way that Jesus asks the same question, he says, where is your heart? Look back at what Jesus says in verse 21. Look at verse 21. Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And just notice the order, because I think we get this wrong sometimes. Notice the order. It's not where your heart is, there your treasure will be. It's where your treasure is. Whatever your treasure is, where that is, where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. So if your treasure, above all else, is to make a lot of money, or to be praised as an academic, or to travel the world, or to build your reputation, or to push a political cause, or even to find a wife, or to find a husband, or to grow a family, if that's where your treasure is, then that's where your heart will be also. Your heart will be centered on the thing that is your treasure. Things which are, if you look at verse 19, of the earth and not, verse 20, of heaven. Not that those things are intrinsically or necessarily bad, but if the things that you think most about and and live for most and give yourself to to most, if if that's your treasure, if that's what consumes your mind, then that's where your heart will be. And really, Jesus is saying those verses. Jesus is just asking us a pretty simple question. Who or what is your master? You know, what what do you seek first? What takes up your thinking all the time? Because you you can't have two firsts. That's the idea of, of a first. There's only one thing that can come first. And you can't have two masters. See, that's that's why Jesus uses language of slaves in verse 24. You cannot be a slave of two masters. You can be an employee of two employers. You can have two employers, but you cannot have two masters because a slave, by definition, only has one master. See, who is it for you? That's what Jesus is asking. And in one sense, it's not that hard to work it out. If you want to know who or what is your master, then just reflect on your life and consider how you spend your life. Or if you're uh, very bold, uh, ask your friend what they think your life is about. And if you're even more bold, ask your wife or your husband, if you're married, what they think your life is about. What are your ambitions? What do you spend your time thinking about? What's, What's in your mind right now? What occupies your mind and thoughts above all else? How do you spend your money if you look through your bank account and just look at where all your money goes? How do you spend your time? And can I say, I find these questions just as hard as you. Sometimes people think, oh, it's really easy for the pastor to get up and kind of ask these questions because, hey, here I am and I serve the church and I'm always doing the church stuff. Can I say, no, no, I find this just as hard as you. As a pastor, I can just as easily be consumed by this thing of the church, this ministry of the church, with all its busyness, and even with all its ambitions that might come, and all its earthly troubles, I can just as easily occupy my mind with the church at the expense of following God as master. I'm with you on this. And because I know that you're like me, because you're a sinner in need of forgiveness just like me, I know who or what your master is actually looks different at different times. We all have our good days and our, and our bad days, and so praise God for his forgiveness. But nevertheless, we are ultimately trying to live with God as master and messing up at times. And again, praise God for his forgiveness. Praise God for the cross of Jesus. Praise God our sins are forgiven. Either you're trying to live with God as your master, and sometimes you mess up, Or God is just simply this nice add-on to your life. 
here are my ambitions, here is what I live for, and, and God just kind of fits in and, and makes me feel good about my ambitions and my earthly treasures. You see, Jesus is asking us a really simple question, who is your master? Is it money? Is it yourself? Or is it God? And how you answer that question helps us to understand what Jesus says next. And this is our next point, a question about worries. So look at what Jesus says in verse 25. Look at verse 25. Incredible words for our modern day. Look at what he says. Verse 25, Jesus says, This is what I tell you. Don't worry about your life. Don't worry about it. What you will eat, what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Because isn't life more than food and, and the body more than clothing? Just think about this. Our modern world is full of so much worry. Uh, all the studies are out saying that younger people now are more anxious than they've ever been before. Which in one sense, it makes sense, right? Because if, if life is about the earthly treasure, if you make your life about earthly treasures, then it will be full of worries. Because earthly treasure, what does it do? It rusts and it decays. And, and thieves, Jesus tells us a bit earlier, Jesus tells us thieves, they come in and they steal and they rob and they rip you off. And so if, if you're living for earthly treasure, then you're always worried about earthly treasure because earthly treasure is fickle. It just disappears instantly sometimes. Of course you worry. And if money is your master or if you are your own master, then everything depends on you. If money is your master, then you need to work harder to get more money. If you are your master, then, then everything falls back on you and what you do for yourself and for your family and for your ambitions. It's all up to you. It all depends on you. And so what do you do? You, you worry because it's up to you if you're your own master. But Jesus, what he says here, it's radical. It's incredible. Jesus says, do not worry. Don't worry. Well, how can you say that, Jesus? Because I am worried. Life's hard and there's so much on all the time and I've got to provide for my family and, and work and boss and they're all pains. And how can you say, Jesus, to me, do not worry? But Jesus says, no, don't worry. Well, how, Jesus? Why can you say to me, don't worry? Because your treasure, O follower of mine, is in heaven where it's secure. Because God is your master, Jesus says. God is your master. Because verse 26, look at verse 26. Because Jesus says, look at verse 26, look at the birds of the sky. Doesn't God provide for them? And verse 28, doesn't God dress the wildflowers? And verse 32, look at verse 32. Jesus says, and isn't worry for the idolaters, for the non-Christian, because they eagerly seek the temporal things of earth. And so they worry. But not you, O follower of mine, says Jesus. Not, not for you, O Christian. Not when God is your master. You don't need to worry. Now there's so much more to unpack here, and uh, you'll do that in your hope groups during the week. But just don't miss the big but simple point that Jesus is saying. With God as your master, with your treasure in heaven, Jesus says, you don't have to worry. No. Understand who your heavenly father is and do not worry about your life. Why? Because God's got this. He's God. He's got it. See, how freeing is Jesus' words here? Knowing that God's got all of it. That even if, even if God decides, which he does sometimes, God might decide no longer to give us daily provisions of food and drink and clothes. Sometimes the Christian departs from this world, this earthly life, too young, too early. God never promises that he'll provide earthly wealth and, and earthly provisions all the time. But even if the Christian departs early from this life, God's still got this. God's still got you. Your eternal life in the everlasting kingdom. Just stop and think and reflect on how freeing that is. Which is why Jesus says what he says next. And this is the last point for the first part of our talk. A question about priorities. Look at what Jesus says in verse 33. Verse 33, Jesus says, But you, Christian, you disciple, you follower of mine, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness 
And all these things, what you will eat, what you will drink, what you will wear, having an anxious, free, ultimately worry-free life, all these things will be provided for you, Jesus says. And Jesus, he's never afraid to be binary. He's never afraid to be you know, black and white about things. He makes it really clear. Jesus says either treasures on earth, which rust and decay and thieves come in and steal, or treasure in heaven, where all things are eternal and secure. Either God is your master, the, the one who's sovereign and ruler of all things and who's all-powerful and all-knowing, or, or money is your master, which is fickle and subject to inflation, as you probably know. Or even worse, yourself is your master. And, and, and how reliable are you? Because I'm not reliable. Because I'm, I'm limited. Jesus says either you seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness with the promise that all things will ultimately be provided, ultimately the new creation with him, or verse 32, you, you eagerly seek other things, like the idolaters, like the non-Christian, things of the earth with all its worries that that brings day after day after day after day. Again, so much to say about these verses. You'll, you'll need to dig in deeper in your hope groups. But Jesus' words force us to ask a very simple question, a question that is perfect for our Commitment Sunday. What do we seek first? What do we seek above all else? What is fundamental to us and our lives? Is it God's kingdom? It was for Jesus. Jesus doesn't say, seek first God's kingdom and, you know, you guys do that and I won't. What did Jesus do? He went to the cross for the kingdom. He's our model. Is it God's vision that's first for you? Of more people becoming followers of Jesus and for those people like you and me, actually becoming more like Jesus? Because that's God's kingdom, us all becoming more like Jesus, his son, to the praise of God. What do we seek first? And this is so important to get right. Please don't misunderstand Jesus' words in Matthew 6. You're not supposed to hear these words and go, what a burden. Jesus is saying, you must follow first my kingdom or else. That's not what he says. This is a promise, such a lovely promise. It's a promise that God's got this. He's got you. That ultimately it's a blessing to seek first God's kingdom. Treasure in heaven. Eternal life. No need to worry for the things of this world. I actually um, uh, felt a bit rebuked preparing this passage during the week because I've been um, in my humanity and in my sin quite worried about today. Because the Building Hope series, it's, it's a hard thing to do. There's so many needs in our church. There's so many things that God's doing. We need to keep working together to keep becoming more like Jesus' son. And I was, I'm, I've been quite worried about today and oh, how, how's this going to go, particularly the second half of the talk, so wait for that. Uh, and then I just thought, what an idiot I am. And God says, no, I've got this. Don't worry. I jo my job is just to be faithful and get on with God's kingdom first. Don't worry. Uh, I, I was worried and I was quite refreshed actually yesterday and this morning thinking, how dumb is that? I'm so worried about today when yet Jesus says, don't worry. They seek first the kingdom. And that doesn't mean that there'll never be trouble in this world. God never promises there'll be no trouble. But actually his promise is even better. Jesus says, even when there is trouble, God's still got you. You don't ultimately need to worry. What you need to do is ultimately seek first God's kingdom. And that will be a wonderful blessing to you. So what we're going to do now is we're going to sing in light of that truth. And then I'll come back up and I want us to think more specifically about church here. So the band's going to come up and lead us in our song. So please stand. Well, please take a seat. How, how good is that song? That's great. Praise God. So what I want to do, I want to speak more specifically about uh, church here. Uh, and I want to reassure you uh, of something as part of our Commitment Sunday. Uh, and it's in light of what we just heard before, in light of what we just sang there as well. To commit to what God is doing for his kingdom in this, his church, it will be a blessing to you. Uh, I can promise you that because that's what the scriptures say. To, to be on board with what God is doing here in his church will be a blessing to you. And not just because God is doing a thing uh, in his church here. I shared this graph with you already. 
uh, in week one. So if you missed it, uh, hop on the new website and you can catch up on sermons there. But what I said is that God is doing a thing in his church. It just is. It's, it's evidently true. Uh, but what I, uh, that, that, grow, that God is just growing his church here. It's, it's uh, hugely exciting. And I hope you feel this as well. It's a great blessing to be part of that. To just, there's so many people I know who are part of churches that don't always grow. Not because that church is doing anything wrong. Just it's a, it's a provision of God and God is doing a thing here. And we get to be part of it. I think that's hugely uh, incredible and a great blessing. But I also uh, shared two weeks ago, that as exciting as that graph is, one concern I have for us as a church is how irregular we are meeting together each Sunday. And the reason I share that concern was not because I want people to feel rebuked and feel guilty and like, oh, you know, preacher man having a go at us for not being at church every week. That's not the reason. It's because, brothers and sisters, I want you to realize how great a blessing it is for you and for the rest of this church and the people in this church for us to meet together as God's people. It's only as we meet together as God's people, under God's word, in prayer, that we help each other to seek first God's kingdom. That will be a blessing to us. And I spoke enough about Sunday uh, church two weeks ago, so if you want, uh, hop back online and you can hear it if you missed it. But meeting together, it's not just a Sunday thing, it's, it's, it's an all-of-life thing, but in particular, it's also a hope group thing for us as a church. Uh, so now I want you to pull out your special handouts. Please pull it out. Please make sure you've got it there. It says Commitment Sunday on the front. Uh, if you don't have one, stick your hand up, please. Stick your hand up. Don't be embarrassed. Uh, if your wife has one and you're married, your husband has one, you need one as well. Uh, 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 please, family participation moment time. We're not a social club. We're not a political group. Uh, you know, we're not here just to kind of sit and, and, and just observe. No, we're a church family. Everyone needs one. And you need a pen. Make sure you've got a pen near you. There's people coming around. Don't be embarrassed because when I talk to this, I want everyone to fill it out. I don't want you to look at me. It's, it's, a, it's a family participation time. Uh, and I just ask you to trust me in this. Everyone, make sure you've got one. If you're here for the first time, again, lovely to have you here. Uh, you can just you know, draw nice drawings on it or something like that and just observe what we're doing. Uh, this is uh, for everyone, but particularly if you're a new person here, again, we're doing something uh, different today. But if you've got that now, what I, want you, what I want to do is to persuade you about hope groups. Uh, what are hope groups? Hope groups uh, are groups of about 12 people from our church who meet together each week during the school term. So uh, if you're in a hope group, you meet together about eight times uh, every term. So about 32 times uh, per year, only 32 times per year. And what you do in your hope group is you read God's word together, uh, you meet together, you pray together, and you encourage one another to live for Jesus. Hope groups, they are a great blessing. But on the whole, we're not very committed to our hope groups. So uh, here's a graph for you up on the screen. This goes all the way back to 2018. Um, and I won't speak to all of it, but in a nutshell, currently about 36% of our church are regular at our hope groups. So to, to give you some ideas of numbers, that's about 87 adults out of 350 adults. So 87 adults out of 350 adults who are members of our church are regular at our hope groups. And if you look at that graph, it's been around that figure for quite a while. And I think it's partly the way that we've done hope groups in the past. Uh, and of those 87 adults who are the regular members, 35 of them are the group leaders. They're the hope group leaders. So when you take the hope group leaders out, there are 52 adults out of 350 who are uh, regular to our hope groups. Now, I said this two weeks ago. Part of me doesn't care about the stats. Um, please don't mishear me. I don't care about the numbers but I do care massively for the individuals behind those numbers. Uh, I care greatly for all of you. Uh, I care greatly for all of your Christ-likeness. That's why I'm here as a pastor. Uh, just this week, I've been here uh, about six months. Just this week, I got to the end. I've started the end part of our church role as I pray for each of you by name. So just this week, I got to the, you know, towards the end of that role, up to the W's, uh, getting towards the very end of praying for each one of you individually in our church. There's about 600 people in our church. And when I pray for all of you, I pray that you might become more like Jesus, God's son. I even pray, because so many names come up that 
uh, I'm still learning who people are, so I don't even know who I'm praying for. But I pray, oh, if they're not much at church, that they might come more. If they're actually not even here at church anymore, I pray they found a good church, that they can grow more like Jesus. Because in one sense, I don't care if people come here or not. I care that people grow more like Jesus. That's why I pray for you. But the means that God uses by his Spirit to make us more like Jesus, his Son, are his word and prayer and his people. That's why I care so much about how often we meet together as God's people because uh, under God's word, in prayer, together as God's people, they're the means that God uses to grow us. There are 365 days in a year and if we attend church every Sunday and attend every single hope group without missing even one for a whole year, we would meet together as God's people under his word in prayer 84 days out of 365. Only 84 if you're at church every week and at Hope Group every week. And of course we get sick, there's things that are on, sometimes we miss stuff, I get that. But I just want us to understand, it's so important for us to help each other. I can't help you by myself live for Jesus. We need to help each other, you need to help me. We need to help each other to seek first God's kingdom. And that's why Hope Groups are such a great blessing. But to help but persuade you, I thought I'd get someone else uh, to come uh, tell us how good it is. So where's uh, Vincent? Come up, brother. If you just grab that microphone there on the side, that would be great. Everybody make him feel welcome as he comes up. Thank you. It's always an intimidating thing to come up. Uh, welcome, brother. Hi, mate. Good. <laughs> now, you, you, you're a member of uh, Hope Group. Uh, this year, what, what have you found uh, most valuable in being part of a, of a Hope Group? Uh, it's amazing. So I just say, um, my wife and I have been to Hope Church like one and a half years now. I still remember the day first of May we come in here and the first song we sing is Rejoice. Oh, there you go. The song we just sing. Praise so God. yeah, it also reminds me just right, Rejoice in the Lord always. So it's really good. So yeah, we've been coming to Hope Group in the last one year and it's an amazing journey. And I'm get, glad that we are one of the wet life <laughs> last year. <laughs> Um, so um, every Friday that we come to Hope Group and then it's just really good that we value the relationship that uh, we build up with the brother and sister because where it's just a really good place that we can uh, study the word of God and then we can like, learn each other and especially we pray for one another which is a really good thing on the Friday Hope Group. Yeah, thank you. Um, in being part of that Hope Group, how have you grown in particular? Like what's one way that, that God's made you more like Jesus, his son, uh, in being part of the group? Yep, so we are very blessed because we have Lars and Sophie. Because if you know Lars and Sophie, I think in my opinion, we have the greatest scripture leaders in our group. So Praise God. Yeah, so I know everyone from time to time, like we're going through different seasons, and then we have up and down, and then uh, every week we at Hope Group, we gather our prayer requests. And then it is so beautiful to see like God turns those prayer requests into the praise report. So it's really important as we like two or three gather in the name of Jesus and we know Jesus in, in us and then we pray and then we can see those praise report. Yeah, great. Uh, you've got a captive audience for the moment. How would you persuade people to be part of a hope group? What would you say if someone's not in one or thinking or maybe hasn't been regular at one? What might, what might you say? Yep, um, as at the opening, I think Cameron read a scripture in Hebrew, um, and then it's really a good that, that we, we just keep, keep, keep coming and gathering together and do not underestimate the power of gathering, the hope group, and we learn together and do not underestimate the power of prayer. And then because God knows you, and then we go together and just like you can see uh, all the blessing, and we are all blessed to be a, a blessing to others. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Make him feel thanked for helping us out. Thank you. And, you know, uh, again, a moment of honesty here. Uh, when I'm in a small group, I find it hard to turn up. It's like, oh, I, don't, I, I cannot be bothered. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. But every time I go, it's always brilliant and it's always worth it. And you're not going to go to a hope group and have this kind of magical moment, maybe unless Lars and Sophie are your hope group leaders and they do a wonderful job. But uh, it's not going to be, a, you know, kind of once every time you go, it's going to be, whoa, this is mind-blowing. No, no, no. It's, it's the constant sitting together with other people who are Christians under God's word, Sundays, hope groups. That's the means God uses to persevere you. 
and to grow you to be like Jesus. It's not radical. There's no silver bullet. See, hope groups, they really are a great blessing. So here's what I'm inviting you to do for 2024. I'm inviting you to opt in. Uh, We haven't done it this way in the past. I'm inviting you to say, yes, I'd love to join a hope group in 2024. But this is the key. I only want you to opt in if you can commit to being part of that group. This, This is really important. See, hope groups, they only work if the people of that group are committed to each other. And I understand we all have different life circumstances, uh, you know, different things that occupy our time we have to consider. I, I get that. I fully understand that. But please don't opt in if you're planning only to come two out of eight weeks a term or three or four out of eight weeks. Unless you're a shift worker uh, and have those particular circumstances because the group will not work and it will be a huge discouragement to the group and to the leaders of that group who spend hours preparing if then people don't turn up. But what I will say is if you opt in and commit to being in a hope group next year, it will be a great blessing to you and to the people in that group because they need you. You need them, they need you. Uh, And you need each other to point each other to Jesus. So if you grab your uh, special handout again, if you open it up, you'll see inside there's a section that says hope groups. Uh, And I, I want everyone to fill it out so that people aren't looking around thinking, who's filling it out? Again, if you're here for the first time, lovely to have you here. Just draw a smiley face or something. Um, I, please, everyone fill this out. And the first thing you need to do is neatly write your name and uh, your mobile and email up the top. Uh, neatly, please. No doctor's handwriting because then we can't read it. Again, this is, this is church participation time. Everyone, please, grab a pen, fill it out. Even if you're in a group this year, because the groups are going to have to reset as we do congregational things. So please pull it out. Write your details on the top. Even if you're not, not uh, able to commit, you can tick that as well. Uh, if, you, if you're not going to be part of one, then we won't chase you up because you've ticked, I'm not going to be part of one, so that's fine. So please start filling that out. And then circle which congregation you're a part of uh, on the form uh, because in 2024, we're going to organize hope groups per congregation because this is your 9 a.m. church family. This is the people you see every Sunday, so you want to see them through the week as well to encourage each other. Spur one another on. Uh, and then there are three options there. So three main tick boxes there, uh, which says, I'd love to join a hope group, but I'm not sure of my availability. So if that's you, tick that box. Uh, I'd love to join, and here are all the options I can make, and then tick as many of those options as you can. If you've got a preference, you can put that in the bottom comment slip. But the idea is tick as many as you can, uh, or you tick the last box, I'm unable to commit to a hope group. Uh, Nikhil, can you give me a pen? Because I'm going to fill this out as well. I'm not going to ask people to do things that I'm not going to do. Uh, so please, please fill that out now. Uh, if, if you're not sure and you want to spend a bit more time thinking or understand more, write that in the comment box. Uh, I'm not sure. Can I talk to you more about it? Um, I'm going to tick the I'd love to join a hope group box. And then I'm going to tick, because I know what my commitments are for all my nights church-wise next year, and there's lots on. So I'm going to tick the men's early morning group. Uh, and so that will be a group that meets at 6.30 or 7 or 8 a.m. There will be coffee involved. Um, hopefully some men will come join me for an early morning hope group. There will definitely be coffee involved. Uh, if you're a woman who doesn't work on Thursdays, can I encourage you uh, to tick the box that says Thursday 9.30 a.m. women's? So if you're a woman who doesn't work on Thursdays, can I encourage you to tick that box for the daytime group uh, on a Thursday morning, uh, no matter what your age or stage of life, because th- this is, with that group, we're going to try to do something a bit special. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity to live out what the Bible says in Titus chapter 2, we having uh, the different generations of women encouraging each other in Jesus. Uh, and so we'd love a, a bunch of our women to, to be part of that Thursday day group. It'll be, look a little bit different to other groups. Um, and if you've got little ones... Uh, um, then there'll be crash there as well for them. Now, those forms, they'll be collect- collected in the last song uh, with our box as per normal, where we do our connect slips. All the details will be collated, and then sometime in December, uh, we'll, we'll, um, we'll share what the groups kind of have worked out to be. Um, and some of the groups will look quite similar. If you've been in a group this year, it'll be quite similar next year as this year. Um, but also lots of them might look different because heaps of new people have joined church. We're going to do things congregationally, so there will be some changes. 
But I just want to say one last time, if you are a committed member of a hope group in 2024, it will be a blessing to you. It's, it's, it's worth committing to. It will help you to seek first God's kingdom, to be on board with God's vision. But I want to talk very briefly now to the back. So if you look now on the back of your handout, it says serving. And I want to talk very briefly to that because we need the people of this church to serve for the sake of the people of this church. We can only operate as a church as we serve one another. And this is, this is an expression of seeking first God's kingdom. And if you look on the back of your uh, special handout, there's a whole bunch of stick, tick boxes there. And there are some things listed uh, on purpose that are kind of high priority things at the moment. So the ones that says, uh, I'd be interested in joining the cleaning team. We need lots more people to join our cleaning team. Uh, the morning tea team, so we have uh, supper, uh, morning tea every week. We need people to join that team. The grounds team, we have lots of lawns. We need people to, grow, uh, to join that team. And the tech team, in particular, just to click the slides to operate what we call ProPresenter to make the slides kind of flick. So if they're simple ones for you, um, we'd love you to tick that. And there's other boxes you can tick. I'm already serving, or I'd be interested in, in talking about other options. Um, so I don't want to spend long on that one, but just as you look at it, Feel free to tick some boxes. But I want to spend the last chunk of our time talking about our giving. Uh, and so there's the, the giving section there on the form. And firstly, uh, I want to be up front and say, I, I'm not embarrassed whatsoever to talk about money to our church. Uh, I'm not embarrassed about that at all. Because what you give and what I give is part of seeking first God's kingdom. And if I didn't talk about money some part, sometime through the year as a church pastor, I'd be failing in my job as a pastor. So again, if you're here for the first time, we don't do this every week. I want to be really clear. But this is the time of year where we do it uh, in, a, in a pretty focused way. Uh, so let me tell you some things about Hope Church and money. Firstly, so you know, there is no magic pot of money for us to draw from. Uh, we've been hugely best in the buildings that, that have been built for us, all our buildings, our whole site. Uh, has been done for us. And that's been a huge blessing. You might not know this, but every single Anglican church in the Diocese of Sydney, uh, so about 270 other churches, all of them pitched in, small amounts each, to build what we have here. They all contributed so that we have a building and a site to meeting. And I think that's a wonderful blessing. We never would have afforded it on our own. It would have cost us about $10 million. Uh, today's terms, because everything's gone up, probably more like 12 or $13 million. We never would have had what we had. But now, we're on our own. <laughs> We've been cut off, uh, so to speak. So here's our current uh, giving and trend for the year. Uh, and just again, to be clear, our monthly budget for 2023 has been 53540 per month. It's a lot of money. And that money, it needs to come from us. There's no government money that comes to us to make that total up of 53000 there's no Anglican church money that kind of gets thrown our way to make up that 53000 It comes completely from you and me, uh, under God, of course. And praise God, like if you look at how, how we've gone so far, we started a bit slow, but praise God how we've gone this year. Uh, it, it's wonderful to see how we've gone. For the year on a whole, we're, we're looking at about a shortfall of $30,000, which is about 5% of our yearly budget. That's excellent. And this is where the money goes. So here's the graph of where all the money goes, just roughly speaking. Uh, and as you can see, most of it goes towards the, the ministry team, the ministry staffing. 70% uh, towards uh, Cam and Marty, uh, Robin, our administrator, our student minister, and myself. And just so you know, our pay, it's set to the guidelines of the Sydney Anglican Diocese. So there's no private jets. <laughs> No secret holiday homes, nothing like that. It's all very transparent. If you type in Sydney Anglican Pay in Google, you'll find the remunerations guideline and you can know exactly what I get paid, exactly what the ministry team get paid. It's very transparent and that is a good thing. It's a very good thing. And actually, every year leading up to our church AGM, every single member of church gets our audited, audited financial accounts. So before March next year, uh, late Feb, you'll get an email as a church member with all our financial details and where all the money has gone for our last audited year. So you know where everything goes. It's very transparent. It's a good thing. But as you can see on that graph and from the, the one before, it costs a lot of money to run our church. Uh, we do it as economically as we can, but even uh, the costs around maintaining our sites per year 
To maintain this site every year, we have to budget about $110,000. $110,000 just to maintain our site. Aircon, fire systems, maintenance, grass, lawn, all that sort of stuff. $110,000. And we have a lot of people who give their time to do that. Uh, and as you know, next year we're bringing on new ministry team members. And we need to do that because we've grown. Uh, we need to have more people come on board. And because of good old inflation, the budget needs to go up for next year. So here's uh, the figures for next year. We've decided this as a parish council uh, in our last meeting. So our 2024 budget will increase by about $8,500 per month, which is a scary figure. $8,500 per month. But for your encouragement, because we are a growing church, our, our giving is growing as our church grows. So this year, in 2023, we actually grew $10,000 per month on average in our giving. So 2022 compared to 2023, each month this year, we gave $10,000 more per month. Uh, over $130,000, actually, I think it was, per, uh, for the whole year, we gave more this year than last year. So that figure of eight and a half grand uh, per month is achievable. Uh, it's reasonable. And to be honest... If we're going to reach that figure, then what we need to do is we need to partner together to get there. We need to be committed financially to what God is doing in his church here. Uh, we need to be committed to seeking first God's kingdom. And I spoke in greater length about money when we looked at Malachi chapter 3. You can find that sermon online. Uh, we did that a couple of months ago. I actually gave lots of reasons that Sunday why you should not give to church and should not give to God because I wanted to be clear about why you give. But today, I want to encourage you to get on board in giving to your church. So again, have your form there. And this time, turn to the uh, section that says giving. And please, I want everyone to do this again. Even if you're saying thank you, but no thank you, that's fine. I, I really want everyone to do this because I don't want people to look around and realize what other people are doing. I, I, I want a sense of not pride or shame in this process. So fill in your details again. You have to put your name and mobile and email again. And write it neatly and clearly. Again, no doctors running writing. And the reason you need to fill it out is because only our treasurer will get this side of the form. So there's a little uh, scissor there. Only the treasurer will get this side of the form. Uh, Rodney Cozier is our very brilliant treasurer. I'm very thankful for him. Only he will see this form. None of the pastors of the church will see it. And so you know, none of the pastors in this church know what any of you give. I do not know what any of you in this church give. I only know what I give and what Emily gives because we give together. I have no idea what you give, and that is a good thing. I do not see the bank details of our church. I have no access to our account. Only our wardens do and our treasurer does, which is a good thing because there's transparency. So I want everyone to fill this out, again, even if you say no. But before we fill it out, I just want to share with you a graph that our treasurer shares with us at each parish council. So it's up there on the screen. And uh, what that shows is how many individuals give any given month in our church. So at the very beginning of the graph, that goes back to October 2022. So we had 98 people that month that gave to church. Uh, and if you look at the very other end, that's last month, October 23. So we had 118 individuals who gave to church last month. And our treasurer has shared with our parish council that some of those 118 people are children and youth. So some of the figures of the 118, it's $5 in a month or $5 a week. Uh, and praise God for them. And others in those figures are, are individuals who give two or $3,000 per month. Uh, so they're, they're just raw numbers. But that's encouraging. It's encouraging to see as our church grows, there's more people who are coming on board with giving, which is great. But there are roughly 350 adults in our church. 350 adults who are members of this church at this point. Uh, and, and again, we've got, to, we, we've got to be honest with these numbers. Uh, some of the 118 will represent families. So there's a husband and wife in that one number. But even so, taking that into consideration, there's probably about 160 adults who are members of our church that come regularly enough to church who aren't on board in giving, it seems. So if you look at that form now, I want to ask us all a couple of questions as a church. If you are not yet giving regularly to your church, will you come on board? And just to give you some perspective, 
If each one of those 160 adults or so gave $20 a month, only 20 bucks a month, right? Netflix subscription sort of stuff. If 160 of those people who currently do not give gave $20 per month, then we would meet half of our budget increase for next year already. If those same 160 people gave $50 a month, that's about $10 a week, two and a half coffees a week. If those 160 people gave two and a half coffees worth of money a week, then we would meet all of our 2024 budget increase of eight and a half grand. And imagine if they gave $100 per month or $500 per month. And I want to be upfront, I'm very aware of the cost of living pressures. God does not call on you to give beyond what you're able to give. You are free to give. You don't have to give above what you're able to give and what God's given you in your circumstance. But God does call you to be generous with the money he has given you. And just, just to be like somewhat frank, God is worthy, isn't he? To come on board with giving to what he's doing in the church that you're a part of. I don't want, I don't want this to be guilt-driven, but, but God is worthy, isn't he? He's our God. So can I ask, if you haven't yet come on board in giving, or maybe you've only just joined us recently, will you come on board? Uh, if so, uh, tick that first box. I would love to come on board with regular giving. Um, now, again, I'm filling this out too. Uh, I'm going to tick uh, the second box. Uh, Emily and I have had some change of our circumstances financially uh, in the last couple of months. Uh, we need to revisit our own family budget for 2024, and part of that is us considering can we increase our giving. So I'm going to tick that box. Uh, maybe you're in a position to do the same. Maybe you're in a position to increase what you already give. Uh, again, I don't know how much you give. But just for perspective, if those 118 people who regularly give, if they all gave, again, an extra $20 in a month, then we'd meet half the budget. The budget increase. If, if all those people said, actually, I can give $50 more per month, then we would meet uh, pretty close to our whole budget increase for 2024. And now, now is a good time to consider your giving because what all of us will need to do, again, lots of information today, if you pull out your normal handout, pull out your normal handout and look on the back, and on there there's a little thing that says giving, and there is our brand new bank account details. As I said, we've been cut off. <laughs> We have our own bank account now, uh, the, uh, and it's called Anglican Parish of Leppington. Sounds very formal. Um, there are our new bank account details. So even if you're currently giving, you will need to switch your giving um, details and bank details and your direct debit stuff to that account. So now is a, is a really good time just to think and prayerfully consider, uh, can I increase my giving $20, $50, whatever it might be. And, and for a whole bunch of us, maybe you can't. That's fine. But now's a good time because you have to change the details anyway. And there's a little QR code that will take you to our new website with those details. And there's a giving booklet there as well if you want to think more about giving. Um, but uh, back to that form, there's a couple of other boxes. I'm already prayerfully giving. You might tick that. That's fine. And a select few of us, we might tick, look, I'm not in a position to give. And if that's you, because there are particular circumstances where someone cannot give at all, I think they're very rare, but there are circumstances you might want to tick that box. But the last thing I want to talk about, I know I've gone long this morning, the last thing I want to talk about is, is our one-off giving appeal. And really, it's if you're in a position to help us catch up on our 2023 deficits on top of your normal giving, uh, I don't know what your circumstances are, you might be in a position to do this, but our budget for 2023, we're looking at a $30,000 shortfall for this year. And so wouldn't it be lovely to see if you could catch that up as we come towards the end of the year? Uh, and we're, we're in it. Our position is fine for this year because we didn't have some staffing appointments. So our, our expenses have been less. But if we can catch up on budget, that will really help us to kick off well next year. And I am denied about saying this and telling you this. Uh, I decided I'm comfortable to. Because Emily and I, we want to partner with you. I'm not standing up here asking you as a church to do something that I'm not willing to do or that my family is not willing to do. And so Emily and I, we're going to write it in. We're going to contribute $200 towards catching up on that budget uh, for this year. Um, I'd love you to join us as a one-off if you can. But the other big thing I want to mention is we have future building needs. Again, we've been cut off and we've got future building needs. Uh, and so that's the next thing just on that little form there. And we have great buildings, 
But part of the original design of this building is that cryo room at the back there at the moment uh, will need to be removed if we keep growing. That's part of the design of the building. And that cryo room will be removed and there'll be a, a new cryo room built outside and our lobby will be extended. If we keep growing like we have been, we will need to do that in the next two, three, four years. That's just the reality of the space that we have. Um, there's no money to help us do that. We have to do that ourselves. Uh, we also, we, 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 have some, we have to spend some money to fit out our office in the demountables. Uh, so the demountables, they were gifted to us, they were given to us, praise God, but they've never been fitted out. We've got more ministry team coming, we have to spend some money on that. Again, amazingly, if you, if you know the, the, the site that's been, the subdivision that's happened on the back of our site over there, there's 14 blocks that have been built over there. One of those blocks have been gifted to our church. It's incredible. $650,000 block of land given to us. Praise God. How good is that? Again, I don't know if you've been part of other churches. That's, it's mind-blowing. Huge blessing. But we as a church now need to build a house on that block of land. Uh, and it costs about $600,000 to build a house. Uh, that's, that's the cost of building a house nowadays. I know if you built one, it would have been cheaper. That's the cost nowadays. Pretty typical four-bedroom house. $600,000. And what that will do is house one of our church families, uh, which means we don't need to pay dead rent money. And so we're actually helping to pay off a house and part of a mortgage of a house that will bless this, the people of this church in 20, 30 years' time. That's all I'll say. There's a whole bunch of building works that we still need to do. And praise God, we've already been saving as a church. We've got a good kitty of money already. We've been saving. Uh, we've got some money ready for these things because we knew they were coming. But we still have a long way to go. So if you're in a position to do so, will you get on board to contribute to those needs as a, as a one-off giving? And again, because I want to model this and express that Emily and I are with you, uh, we've decided that we'll contribute $1,000 towards that. Not to boast, but just to express that, that I'm with you, that we're, we're, we're partnering with you on this. And I want to add every single one of your ministry team members, they all give to the, the financial needs of this church. Which sounds funny because they get paid by the church and then they give money back to the church. But that's important. It's discipleship. They're partnering with you. So if you're able, uh, write that down on that form uh, if you're able to contribute towards our, our ongoing building fund. Uh, and with that building fund, uh, you'll get an email from Rodney. So the way this will work, um, I'm going to finish up now. You'll be glad to know. Uh, Rodney, our treasurer, will go through these. Uh, if you can actually carefully if you're able to tear that down the middle now uh, that would be really helpful uh, just do it nice and carefully um, that way Rodney doesn't have to chop about whatever 300 forms across the whole day and during the last song um, the, the normal boxes will come around and if you've ticked yes on any of the giving stuff Rodney our treasurer will send you an email if it's for regular giving or if it's a one-off giving to catch up budget, you can, you can hop online and do that already uh, and give through the normal bank account details, the new ones on this form. But if you're going to give towards building stuff, wait for Rodney to email you because uh, the building fund is a different thing. Um, so those forms will be collected uh, at the end uh, in our next song. But brothers and sisters, uh, God is doing a great thing in this church. He just is. It's God's church, and there's so much to be excited about. And I trust you have been excited about the things we've shared so far in our Building Hope series. Uh, but I hope you get on board with what God's doing. I hope you'll seek first God's kingdom, to see more people become followers of Jesus and for those people to become more like Jesus. So let me pray now uh, that we might be captured by God's vision. Well, Heavenly Father, we give you great thanks for all the things you are doing in your church. Uh, we thank you, Father, that we have been caught up by your vision because you've saved us to belong to Jesus, your Son. And we ask, Father, that you might help us all to partner in whatever way we can with what you're doing in this church, to see us grow in maturity, to become more like Jesus, to the praise of Jesus' name. This we ask in his name. Amen. Well, I think, uh, is it Donna that's going to lead us in some more prayers? Thanks, Donna.